So, dear colleagues and friends, you will have noticed by now that I am your host for today. Some would say it's, it's a money-saving effort. So, um, we now come to our uh, first uh, plenary session, and the first part of this is on the regulatory framework, and the scope of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. Um, as we all know, uh, this is the year of the refit, the exercise whereby the Commission evaluates the, the Directive's fitness for purpose. We also know that prior to embarking on this exercise in 2013, the Commission published its Green Paper, preparing for a fully converged audiovisual world, uh, which invited stakeholders to share their views on the changing media landscape and borderless internet, in particular on market conditions, interoperability and infrastructure, and the implications for EU rules. Question 11 of the Green Paper asked, is there a need to adapt the definition of audiovisual media service providers and or the scope of the directive in order to make those currently outside subject to part or all of the obligations of the directive? Or are there other ways to protect our values? In which areas could emphasis be given to self or co-regulation? In the preamble to the Council of Europe uh, Committee of Ministers 2011 recommendation on a new notion of media, uh, Philip Boyard uh, quoted a, a keynote speech given in Reykjavik in 2009 by the late great Karol Jakubowicz at a meeting of ministers responsible for the media. Karol Jakubowicz reminded us that for Shakespeare's Juliet, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. We, on the other hand, are not sure whether or not what we see emerging around us can and should be classified as media. We do not know if we can trust the information we receive from those sources, nor do we know whether or not our policy and regulatory frameworks apply to these new modes and technologies of communication. Six years have passed since the Reykjavik conference, but the questions still remain. Now, to shed some much welcome light on the possible future regulatory framework, we have with us three experts who will be familiar to most of you. I'd like to call to the stage uh, Maya Capello, Alexander Scheuer, and Lorena Bois Alonso. Maya Capello, Dr. Maya Capello, is head of the Department for Legal Information at the European Audiovisual Observatory. Before joining the observatory in 2014, Maya worked for the Italian regulator AGCOM uh, from 1998 and was head of AGCOM's Digital Rights Unit of the Media Services Directorate. At AGCOM, she dealt with audiovisual regulatory issues at European level both contributing to international conferences and committees, and participating as national expert in the EU and Council of Europe cooperation projects. She's the author of articles and speeches in the areas of audiovisual media services, media pluralism, copyright, and consumer protection. Maya holds a master's in EU law and a PhD in European social law. She was also vice president of the EPRA from 2011 until 2014. On my far left, but not politically, <laughs> we, we have Alexander Scheuer, a lawyer. Now, before joining Deutsche Telekom in July 2013, he was general manager of the Institute of European Media Law and is currently a member of the Institute's Research uh, Scientific Advisory Board. He was a member of the advisory committee and the IRIS Editorial Board at the European Audiovisual Observatory. Since 2003, he has been a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Voluntary Self-Regulation of Private Televisions in Germany and is currently the Board's Vice President. 
Alexander has been responsible for several major studies in the area of media and telecoms law and has published widely on European media, telecommunications, protection of minors and copyright law. In the middle we have uh, Lorena Bois Alonso who is the European Commission's Head of Unit for Converging Media and Content Unit. Uh, a D DG for Communications, Networks, Content and Technology. Formerly, uh, uh, Lorena was Deputy Head of the Cabinet of Vice President Nelly Cruz, uh, the European Commissioner for the Digital Agenda. Lorena holds a, a, a Master of Laws uh, with a focus on antitrust law and intellectual property from the Harvard Law School. She graduated in law from the University of Valencia and then obtained a license, uh, licence spéciale en droit européen from the, university, uh, from the Free University of Brussels. She joined the European Commission's DG competition in 2003. Prior to that, she has worked for Judge Rafael García Valdecasas at the European Court of Justice as well as Deputy Director and Legal Coordinator of the IPR Help Desk Project, and she was in private practice in Brussels. Um, each speaker will now speak for some 10 to 15 minutes max. Um, I will probably have one, maximum two questions, and then we will have, we'll open the discussion to the floor, because I believe um, the Commission would be extremely grateful for any input, positive input we can make to this uh, review exercise. So first I'll call upon uh, Maya Capello, please. Thank you very much, Andres, for this introduction. Thank you for uh, this invitation. It's an impressive place to be here, and uh, it's good to see friendly faces. Some of you I already know, and this uh, makes the impact of opening a little bit uh, easier to live with. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I should press the green one, right? This is the... Yeah, I guess. I, I will try and see. Yes, it was the green one. Um, within the time slot I've been given, I will try to give you uh, some inputs uh, for our uh, plenary session. Uh, you will see I will uh, touch the two sides of scope, which means that I will uh, touch a little bit upon what will happen in the next plenary, but without exempting anything. This is just to uh, be considered as a general introduction. We'll have a look at what happens also outside the EU. This is a presidency conference of the EU, but of course there are many things happening outside. And being a representative from the European Audiovisual Observatory based in Strasbourg and part of the Council of Europe, this could not be missing in my presentation. And then I will try to contribute to the discussion by inspiring you with some questions that uh, you might be uh, happy to follow up on. So to start with um, the uh, first side of, of the scope, uh, so which services we are talking about, this leads me uh, just to uh, briefly remind everyone about uh, the time frame. These dates are all familiar for everyone, I think, in this room. 1989, the first directive, the amendments in 97, then something happened 10 years later in 2007, and in 2010, we had the first consolidated version of the directive. It's quite long ago. Uh, but we are still using the criteria that were established by the directive in order to identify the services that we are talking about. It looks quite easy. I mean, it's a list. It must be a service. That must be an editorial responsibility. We must have a media service provider. And this provider must have a certain purpose, which is to inform, entertain, educate. We all know this. Um, and whom? The general public. And this must happen on electronic communications networks. It's all very easy. It looks easy on paper. But then when we have a look at what happens around us, we see that we have many global players which are a bit difficult to fit into this description. We had many criteria, but then when we try to do the exercise, it's not always easy. 
We have YouTube, we have Facebook, Netflix, but we have even a more complex situation. I would like, it's very small, but I would just like to uh, show you this very interesting graph. This is from the Dutch Research Center, TNO. It's called the Value Web, the Telecom's Value Web, where you see all the integrations that are happening. I will help you read because I think it's very small. We start from the left-hand side with the content and info creation, so the creators of the content. We go to the aggregators, that's the second from the left. The services are produced, they are aggregated, then they are distributed. We have navigation and selection tools. And on the very right hand side, we have the pure consumer. What you see in colored routes are the different ways of accessing audiovisual content. And I'm saying now audiovisual content and not audiovisual media services exactly because I would like to underline that we are now in a world with a lot of content which is sometimes a bit difficult to classify. The red route is the one uh, leading to the over-the-top services. And you see that, for example, Netflix is appearing in all the boxes apart from the very right one. Uh, the, the consumer side, where uh, is still, uh, it's necessary to access content from, from different operators. It's very complex, and the definitions that we had, remember these criteria, mm, when it comes to the exercise, this is really a bit difficult. So uh, why all this? Because since the directive, we've had many developments. We have global players. Uh, some of them were already there, uh, at least they were starting their activities, but they were not the giants that we are uh, having now. Uh, we have convergence becoming reality. This means that we have new ways of distributing content and also of accessing them. We have new actors, we have different platforms. I just mentioned here a few of them. We have the telecoms, but I don't want to exempt Alexander from Deutsche Telekom. Uh, he will certainly tell more about the telecoms than I will do. We have ISPs, we have user-generated content platforms, IT technology firms. The technology is becoming more and more present in this chain. And then business models that vary quite a lot from subscriptions, from transactions. Advertising flows is going different ways. And the connected world also makes more and more content available. The consumers have more choice. We know all this. But of course, there is a lot of money going in different directions. And this is also a bit difficult to uh, estimate when it comes to the market share. But one thing is, quite become, it is becoming quite clear. And you see it from this graph. What is jumping, and that is the one in green, is the digital subscription, which means the over-the-top players. And what you see is going down on the minus side is the physical consumption, so DVDs, Blu-rays, the rental, both the rentals and the purchase of the physical uh, DVDs. They are going dramatically down, whereas over-the-top players are growing very, very significantly. This is as to the services, but what happens with jurisdictions? Just a few words on this. We all know the purposes. Uh, the country of origin. It has, uh, it had many uh, good wishes. We, the first one was, of course, to ensure certainty, encourage circulation in the internal market, ensure that some minimum standards were applied wherever you uh, were uh, establishing your company around Europe. Uh, there was also a quite consistent framework within the Council of Europe, as long as the two tools were aligned to each other. But then the situation in reality is somehow developing in different ways. Just have a look here. This is a graph where you see channels targeting different countries. And well, the winner is UK, but we have quite many others here. Uh, we have France, we have Netherlands, Sweden, Czech Republic, and, and moving on. The last one here I, I mentioned is Spain. Uh, because it, I just had to, to, to stop at a certain number. And, and you see, this is linear consumption, but the same is happening for VOD. Here you see the players um, by country of origin. Uh, it's very small, but the light blue are the services aimed for the national market. 
The dark blue is the one for the foreign markets. And I think this is also very significant. Again, the winner uh, here is not uh, UK. You see GB, which is the uh, um, uh, acronym we use at the Council of Europe. It's, of course, UK. Luxembourg is the winner in this case because of uh, iTunes. Um, and uh, uh, Netflix is also playing a, uh, a great role. But you see that the dark blue part is increasing in many of these countries. And to show it on a map, just to have an idea of this, uh, let's say, multi-country approach, you have some uh, leading countries where uh, companies are establishing themselves with the aim of not only providing the services for the national market, but, and this is perfectly legitimate, for other countries. What happens then outside the EU? Well, the Council of Europe, as Andres already mentioned, is also working on this, and it's, there is a very interesting recommendation from 2011, which I recommend to read if you haven't done yet, dealing with this new notion of media. What I find interesting is that it provides several indicators for the uh, interpretation of these issues, and also standards, because this is, of course, uh, one of the aims of the Council of Europe as a standard-setting body. Uh, I don't want to go into deep uh, of all of them, but I just wanted to mention the indicators for the media, uh, which are a bit different from the ones that are in the uh, AVMS directive. There is, must be, first of all, an intent to act as a media. The purposes and the underlying objectives must be the one of the media. There must be an editorial control, which is a common factor indeed. And here we have the professional standards. They were mentioned earlier today. And uh, this is indeed uh, a very important added value, I think, from this recommendation. And then public expectations, which is somehow similar to the TB likeness we will uh, have a look at in a while. But what happens when it comes to the binding instruments? Well, uh, once upon a time we had the directive and a European convention quite aligned. Uh, this work is uh, unfortunately not going uh, so much hand in hand any longer. So uh, last September, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe officially declared to stop the work of uh, developing further standards. So this is uh, now somehow come on, on a sleeping track. But um, let us come back to uh, our field and the AVMS directive. Um, I just want to uh, throw on the table a few uh, tricky issues uh, that we uh, at the observatory at least have selected as some of the, uh, the most uh, triggering. First of all, when it comes to the services, many blurring boundaries are uh, now coming to be quite clear. For example, the, new, the newspaper websites with video content there is explicit exclusion in the directive for the press, but here, I mean, the, their business models are somehow becoming a bit different. User-generated platforms, well, in some cases you have professional channels there, how to deal with them. And then the always evergreen story, download to own, download to rent, how to treat these two different cases. The tool we have is a very important recital from the directive, which is the one of TV likeness. But again, to uh, assess what is TV-like is absolutely not always easy. When it comes to jurisdiction, well, we have many well-known problems. What happens if member states want to regulate in a stricter way than the others? They can, of course. But what if what they receive is considered as being not acceptable because of protection of minors or incitement to hatred? Well, there are specific tools uh, that have been put in place by the directive but it have not been applied many times. So uh, this might also be a bit questioned. And, and what happens uh, in the internet world, in the, on the unmanaged networks? Well, we have the e-commerce directive with standards also there for the protection of these main values, protection of minors and incitement to hatred are mentioned there as well. But the tools are different, so there might be a risk of uncertainty. We have also quite many questions raised by the Commission itself in the Green Paper. I just wanted to select two of them. And question 11 was already uh, mentioned by Andres in the introduction. I've just called it the YouTube question, not because it's only YouTube, but just to recall what we are talking about. One is the YouTube question, the other one is the Netflix question. There are questions 11 and 12. I just picked out these two out of many. Uh, there were many, many questions there. But of course, these two are the ones when it comes to uh, scope. But I have also other ones. Uh, what about the money? I mentioned the money. 
And this is, of course, important when it comes to the title of this conference, which is, I just read it because it was a bit long, strengthening the European audiovisual media market for the development of the European identity. And I think it's important also to recall why we are here. Uh, it means that uh, uh, European production and works and contributions to our identity are somehow in the foreground here in this discussion. And this again leads us to uh, the evergreen question, the level playing field, who's paying for what. And if you are interested in deepening this, allow me a little product placement for our publications. You will find it on our website. And I thank you so much. Okay, in a, in, a, in a radical change of procedure, um, I will ask, uh, I'll give the floor now to Lorena Boalonso of the European Commission. Thank you, Andres, and, and thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm staying because I don't have a presentation and I'm feeling a bit lazy. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the organization of the conference because, uh, as you said before, uh, now that we are in full refit exercise at full speed, uh, these type of events are extremely useful for us because now, let's say that now it's time to talk concrete and to, to really uh, see what are the, the field where we need to, uh, to improve this directive. Uh, thank you very much also for the gender balance. I have to say this on behalf of the Commission because indeed uh, this conference, uh, there's only one panel uh, I saw where there is no uh, women, but I know an effort was, had been done. Uh, so thank you very much. And I, I need to warn you all that if you organize conferences from now on, uh, please be aware that the Commission is paying attention to this. So if I am invited to a panel, I will need to pay attention to the fact of whether uh, the organizers made an effort to, to have uh, women represented. So, voila, I had to say it. Um, now, uh, I think that uh, before uh, touching upon the, 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 the subject of this panel, uh, Andres asked me to, uh, because I'm the first to intervene uh, from the Commission, to give you a little bit of, of uh, feedback, a state of play or where we are as far as the process of refit is concerned. So, well, you all know that uh, it all started uh, with, uh, in, the, in the World Programme, it was announced that uh, we would run into refit uh, in 2015, and then that we would have the, all the needed time so that we would end up this uh, next year. And uh, then for a while we were uh, very much in a mood of waiting to see what happens. Uh, it was sometimes uncomfortable when you were invited to, to, to give speeches because people would be asking you, but what? And we were in this mood of transition from one commission to the other, in a, in a way waiting for some political guidance. Uh, and now we have it, we have them, as, as the Minister uh, rightly said, uh, our Commissioner uh, recently, uh, well, one of our Commissioners, because we have plenty of Commissioners now, but uh, Oettinger, uh, uh, said uh, that REFIT should finish this year and that uh, we would come with a legislative proposal for the AVMSD uh, first half of next year. So indeed, uh, he was listening to the, to the Council call to, to to run this in, a, in an urgent way, uh, but also to the Parliament uh, that is uh, also pushing us to move uh, quickly. Um, let me tell you what uh, this implies in terms of, of work. Uh, this means that uh, my unit is going to be extremely busy. I see two members of my unit there in the back. Uh, uh, so indeed, this is, this is a lot of work and I explain you why. Because refit is one thing and a legislative proposal is another thing. The objective of a refit exercise is a static uh, exercise. It means analyzing the directive and assessing whether the directive, as it is now, has worked well or not, and what, has, what have been the costs and benefits for all the stakeholders of the functioning of this directive. Uh, a legislative initiative exercise is, is, is backed by what we call an impact assessment, as you know which is a forward-looking approach. It's looking at, okay, we are talking from the assumption that there's an issue that we need to fix. And then we need to, to run an exercise to assess all the possible op options and see what would be the impact on all the stakeholders. So it's a 
static and a forward-looking exercise that, given the time uh, table that we have been given, will need to run in parallel. Uh, this is indeed a, a challenge, uh, an exciting challenge, I must say, but a challenge. So what are going to be the next steps? Uh, uh, as you can imagine, we are already working, uh, already for a while. Uh, we are right now uh, preparing what we call the refit uh, roadmap or mandate. Uh, this is a document that will set the roadmap and the main issues uh, where we will be uh, concentrating uh, that will be published. We have already uh, created a steering committee within the Commission, which is simply a, an inter-service group of all the different DGs. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, most DGs in the Commission are, are, are impacted by, by, by the directive. And uh, at the end of the year, or beginning of next year, uh, there will be a document. So uh, there will be a document that what the Commission will uh, say what are the results. Uh, in parallel, we'll need to work on an impact assessment. This means that there will be uh, certainly at one point or another a public consultation. Uh, and this one point or another <laughs> looks very much like this year because we need to come with something next year. Uh, we need to start uh, basically doing all this now. So voila, this is quite a lot of, uh, of work, a challenging work, and this is why we, uh, we, will, need, uh, we will need your help uh, because this work requires a lot of data and information and a lot of dialogue with all the stakeholders. Uh, as far as uh, what is going to back uh, our, our exercise, um, there are several studies that have been already launched or are about to be launched. Uh, there is one on alcohol advertising that is running already one on the regulatory independence of, of, of regulators that is also running and we are about to launch uh, three other studies one on self and co-regulation in the context of the AVMSD, uh, one general on advertising and one which is more technical on, on standards. Uh, we are very thankful to uh, ERGA because ERGA is going to help us a lot as well ERGA has uh, launched uh, several uh, exercises on, on, on the main subjects of, of review, uh, one on material scope, one on uh, territorial or jurisdiction scope, one on protection of minors, and another one on the independence of regulators. And all these studies and ERGA and all that, we will have uh, all the input uh, by the end of this year. Uh, in parallel, of course, we will be uh, trying to gather uh, data one way or, or another. So this is as far as the process is concerned. Uh, as regards the substance, what will be the main issues for review? I think I have uh, said them very often in speeches, but basically you look at the program of this conference and you will find what are the main subjects of, of, of debate uh, because uh, basically... Uh, they are there, it's the scope of the directive, it's the country of origin, the functioning of this principle, uh, the distinction linear and non-linear, and within there, of course, the issues of protection of minors and commercial communications. And of course, last but not least, uh, issues more related to, um, to media pluralism, like the independence of regulators, and also the issue of, of findability, uh, for, for which we will have a panel this, this afternoon. Voilà. So this, as far as refit is concerned. Now, uh, as regards the subject of the panel uh, today, um, I think that Maya has done a, a very good uh, introduction, I would say, basically to the whole conference, uh, because uh, you've touched upon things that will be subject of, of other panels, so I'm not going to deal with, with those. Uh, I will limit myself to some uh, uh, reflections on, on, on material scope, uh, uh, and then, of course, in the questions and answers if, if you want to go beyond, but I will be sure because I've taken already uh, a lot of time. Um, from my point of view, I think that uh, before uh, starting a, a big debate on what, uh, how should we extend or, uh, the directive or whether we should do it, um, maybe we should start by looking at what we have and basically uh, saying what are the benefits of what we have. Then maybe there are some critics, uh, but let's at least point of uh, one of the beauties of uh, how the audiovisual media services uh, defined uh, what should be the scope, which is that we did it in a technologically neutral way. 
And as Maya said, the question at the time uh, was not uh, what providers should be subject, but what services should be su subject to the directive. And, and this is uh, important because by asking what type of services should be covered, uh, we were making sure that whomever would enter the market later on, we wouldn't mind about the nature of this player, but only about the type of services this player was providing. So this is something uh, to keep in mind uh, when we do uh, this review, uh, whether indeed the type of services that we were covering or that we are covering are still fit for purpose. And, and uh, if, if we keep on asking that question, then we will keep uh, and maintain this directive technologically neutral. Something then I, that I think is important to, uh, to raise at this stage is rather than to rush into who should be covered or what should be covered, uh, is why are we asking ourselves these questions? Why are we here having a debate on the, on the scope? Uh, and for that, uh, this is why we introduced this question 11 uh, uh, in, the, in, in the Green Paper to ask what are the issues of, of concern with, with respect to the scope. And when you look at the, at the answers, uh, you realize that uh, those that want to stand the scope of the directive, uh, the majority uh, have as concern the level playing field. The, their concern is, well, there are some other people there that are providing services and, uh, and I think that they should be uh, subject uh, to the directive. So it's not so much, well, I see this uh, objective that should be protected, but rather these people are not regulated. Uh, second comes something that uh, Amaya also uh, raised, which is legal certainty. Uh, and I must say that uh, I agree that uh, when you look at the national practice and you look at the uh, regulators, it's true that sometimes you see that some of them at least are, are not very sure uh, and, and, and they have to, to do a real in-depth analysis of, of what is covered and what is not covered. And uh, I must say that at this stage, after already quite um, many years of application of the directive, I sometimes go to uh, conferences where people say, but, uh, you know, we should extend the, the, the AVMSD directive because Netflix should be sub subject to the directive. And you have to explain to them, but Netflix is subject to the directive. So uh, I think that there is a lot of... Uh, misunderstanding or uncertainty, and there is certainly a need for clarifying things. I, I don't have the answer yet on whether there is a need to uh, extend the directive. This is uh, what we need to discuss, but that there is a need for clarifying certain things uh, that I see it already. Uh, then third comes as regards why should we uh, uh, extend the, the, the scope of the directive of those that are concerned. Uh, m some of them uh, point to protection of minors and certain high values that should be uh, protected. And I think that uh, what is the reply depends very much on what is the concern. And let me uh, now, because I, I'm still in the comfortable position where the Commission doesn't have a position. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> at one point this will change when we, when we have a proposal. So I can still talk in, in general terms um, without saying whether we will uh, go for one or the other. But I see at this stage uh, several options uh, to deal with these type of concerns. Of course, one option would be uh, for those that, of course, want to, to, to extend the, the scope of the directive, and if this is the conclusion also of the, of the Commission, uh, one thing would be indeed to, uh, to change the definition of what are the services. And here, we, uh, an option is indeed to look at editorial responsibility. Uh, the way it was defined uh, at the time was, well, uh, it's, it's the control on the selection and the organization of the programs. Well, some people argue already that uh, you could define editorial uh, control in a different way. Uh, some people even point to, uh, by using algorithms, uh, you are in a way exercising editorial control. It's just a, a different way of exercising it. So there's this debate which is there. Uh, another option is uh, to touch at the TV-like requirement. What is TV-like? Things are changing and 
you see that youngsters watch a different type of content. Uh, what is TV like is something that uh, indeed uh, could be looked up, or, or, or the concept of principal purpose. Uh, when you see so much convergence uh, about, uh, on different media content, you, you could uh, look at that. Another way uh, of touching at the directive uh, would be to say, well, we would extend uh, uh, the scope only for certain concerns. Indeed, if you are worried about protection of minors, you could say, okay, certain players could be uh, subject to certain rules. Of course, this would uh, force us in a way to define who are these services, uh, which what I said before, uh, as a consequence. So that's one way. Another possibility, of course, is, is to deal with these concerns, not in the AVMSD, but in other instruments, e-commerce or other. And here I, I, I would need to point at the, the work that is being done by other colleagues in the, in the DG on the digital single market uh, strategy, where they are looking also at the issue of platforms. Uh, so because uh, very often when we start to really dig into uh, what are these new services and what are the concerns, sometimes you, you reach the point where you say, okay, if these are the concerns, are these only audiovisual concerns? Or is this a concern that applies to the type of content? And then you reach the question, well, well then is the AVMSD the, the instrument? So uh, this is uh, another reflection that we need to carry on. And then, of course, another way to deal with uh, these concerns, as pointed by many in the, in the replies to the Green Paper, is self and co-regulation. Uh, many point to this as a way out, as saying, well, uh, it allows you for flexibility. Um, so uh, we will certainly look at this. So uh, I, I will uh, close it here. I will just mention that Whatever is the outcome, uh, there are certain things that I think uh, we will need to, to be careful at when, when uh, reviewing the directive. One, as I said before, is this technological neutrality. The more you go into defining what's a platform, let's say, uh, the farthest you are in, in this technological neutrality, we will need to pay attention to small players. Uh, that's something that I constantly said. Um, as many see this uh, need for extended the scope as a level playing field, as covering these, uh, let's say, American players, uh, be aware that European players will be also subject to the same rules and will need to pay attention uh, to small players, for example. Not all these people are, are, are the big uh, um, uh, players. Uh, we'll need to pay attention also to the regulators uh, and to the fact that uh, if you extend to more and more type of services, you'll need to be sure that regulators are able to apply the rules. And nowadays it's true when you uh, see what regulators are, are doing, you see that uh, very few are really actively monitoring on demand for whatever reason, maybe it's difficult, maybe it's just uh, not necessary, everything should be exposed, but we will need to, to see at the capacity of applying the law, not only of changing it. And last but not least, we will need to pay attention to internal market issues. In particular, if we look at uh, self and co-regulation, uh, the more you go local, the, the more you, you are far away from internal market uh, uh, coherence. Uh, so if we go more into self-regulation or co-regulation, we need to see whether there's a need also to uh, do it at EU level. And I think now I, I stop and I give the floor to my colleague. No? Thank you, uh, Lorena. I, I like uh, the way you diplomatically described your work in... Uh, uh, in the refit exercise as challenging and exciting. Uh, now our final speaker, uh, Alexander Scheuer. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andres, and thanks for inviting me to Riga. It's a pleasure to be here again, as you know. Uh, particularly in those times, it's, I think, rather also for you, not least nice, but perhaps also important that we are still coming to Riga. Um, I think it, from a didactic point of view, it might be given some use in repetition. Um, frankly speaking, 
originally planned, I was a participant, I would not know now whether you would be interested in hearing more or less the same issues and arguments again from a third speaker. But I'm afraid I will not be able to differentiate a lot on what has been said by Lorena and by Maya. Um, perhaps I can, I can try to focus on some of the issues which were uh, touched, but I will certainly not add very much to what has been said already. Uh, for your information, Deutsche Telekom, as Maya said, we are mainly a telecommunication network operator and uh, e-communication service provider. Um, but as Maya has also said, the uh, value chain of the digital market has expanded very much and uh, from the traditional uh, role, for example, as a cable operator, now telecoms have much more roles uh, in, the, uh, in the economy of the internet. Um, and the notion was also uh, quoted already, we are acting as a uh, platform provider <coughs> also for media content. In its footprint, Deutsche Telekom, with its more than 10 uh, European companies, uh, serves roughly 5.5 to 6 million households with audiovisual offers, including TV and video on demand. And we are trying to follow what is called a best aggregator strategy. And we have a slogan, we want to win with partners. So that is, I think, already uh, pointing to the fact that we are not keen on doing all by ourselves. And we are not keen on um, uh, pretending that we are able to identify at a very early stage who will be the winner in the market, but that we want to be able to offer on our platforms uh, to our customers the most relevant audiovisual media offers that are available, also available to us. So for instance, in Germany, we have a, a so-called video on demand uh, service, uh, video load, which is, which is a transactional video on demand service, uh, which is operated by ourselves. And in addition to that, we have uh, a service from Pro7 Sat1 Group, uh, Maxdome, and Last year, we uh, started a partnership also with Netflix so that our customers can choose from these. Uh, th this would be the kind of services uh, which would come under the uh, scope um, of the Audiovisual Media Service Directive. Of course, there are quite a number of services available which are today not covered by the scope. As a platform operator, we are subject to European Union and national regulation, such as must carry and sector or service specific interoperability requirements. Um, so from our point of view, there's no uh, notion of there is no platform regulation in Europe available. I think there is, but it's probably very sector specific and uh, probably outdated. And uh, you will not wonder that I say this, it is probably also uh, unnecessary at some parts of, of the regulation which is available. Okay, um, for the refit exercise, I would have wanted to ask Lorena um, what is the uh, additional use of the exercise, but I think all my questions you answered already. Thanks for that. Um, I, would have, I would have pointed to uh, the consultation which the uh, Commission did in 2013. I would have pointed to the exchange in the regulators group, uh, also in the contact committee, of course. Um, I would have pointed to application reports which are available at which pick up some of the highlights which uh, the implementation and enforcement at national level brings to the fore. Uh, but that, of course, you have all answered by now. Um, my perception of the status quo, where do we stand? I think we have uh, roughly, depending on the market that you look at, three to five hours of television consumption a day on average. So there's not easy speaking of TV is uh, uh, decreasing in importance. But at the same time, you see uh, that the video on demand services are growing in importance quite considerably. And that has been shown also by Maya's uh, presentation and the figures she gave. Um, <coughs> if you look into uh, TV consumption, we should always be aware that mostly what is measured is whether a TV set is turned on or not. That does not necessarily coincide with consumption of content. 
Um, many services which are on demand stem from traditional TV broadcasters. I think that is also a very important uh, part of the picture that we should be aware of. So uh, TV broadcasters try to expand their reach uh, into the on-demand world. Some of the um, developments which I see uh, I, would, I would like to look into because I think it is important to uh, to look at these when we want to define whether there is really a need uh, to review the directive or to change its scope in whatever way. Uh, first, one thing I, I witness um, today mainly in uh, music services, but also starting uh, in audiovisual services, what I call is a relinearization of on-demand content. Um, you have services which allow users to aggregate um, to aggregate um, content via a certain platform which is on-demand content, but to have it streamed in a sort of channel to them. But these are all, as this is based on, on preferences of users, perhaps recommendations, perhaps uh, references from friends and, and family members. This is all more or less individualized uh, streaming channels, so not necessarily uh, fulfilling the criteria of, of mass media. Um, we have uh, quite a number of platforms which combine linear and non-linear service and which allow seamless switch for the user. Uh, so already on these platforms, um, which are mainly established by the uh, content providers themselves, you do not see much of a difference between the two forms. Um, and what I witnessed recently uh, with RTL in, in Cologne, they have a room, I call it the digital living room, uh, where they have all of the TV uh, sets which are available, all of the set-top boxes, uh, they have all the internet platforms, and then they show what is, what is very uh, topical um, as a new service. And what they showed was on a TV screen, an app, YouTube app, which you started from the linear environment, so you opened up a context menu and you started YouTube. And then, surprisingly, what was shown on YouTube as, as uh, results of your search was exactly the kind of uh, program that you were watching at the very, very moment, or related information to that program. So apparently the search engine already took metadata from the linear program which was available for the EPG purposes or something else uh, and made that part of the uh, search which was initiated and so the results were uh, in this regard. Um, I think that makes quite clear that the um, distinction uh, between linear and non-linear is very difficult to make and I'm not sure whether that is really future proof. So when we discuss about scope, one preliminary remark on that, um, can we really do so without looking into substance at the same time? Uh, and both Maya and, and Lorena have already done so because uh, when introducing the idea of a very differentiated regulatory approach in, in, in a future directive, you mentioned uh, protection of minors as one example of uh, a field a policy objective where one could extend um, the scope of application, uh, ratione materie, um, because of a, a felt need by users, for example, uh, that there should be protection in place. Um, the two questions which, which I feel are the most important ones when it comes to scope um, are dominance, so what is actually is a service predominantly um, aimed at uh, providing content in order to educate, inform, um, and entertain. And what is TV like? That was already mentioned as well by Maya. Uh, then uh, the cases in, in the UK, which I think are most interesting in that, without playing down what has been discussed in Slovakia and in other um, member states, uh, in Italy, in the Netherlands, and so on and so forth. Um, is there editorial responsibility present and to whom can it be attributed? Uh, and when we uh, 
uh, submitted our uh, uh, paper to the consultation of the uh, Commission and talked later on about that with Lorena, uh, I also said these algorithms are very important and you replied, and I think I can quote it here, but these algorithms are also programmed by human beings. And that is a very important uh, thing to bear in mind, I think. Um, what is the, the scope in terms of place? Do we attach that kind of regulation to services which are only located uh, in the EU? Or do we attach it to services which uh, want to be viewed, used, consumed, and paid for in whatever form in the EU? So that is one of the major questions as well. But coming back to um, where, what is the reason for that exercise? What should be our policy objectives? I think that uh, we should try to be more flexible on um, the way we, we treat different services. My preference at the moment would be to say there is quite a lot of linear and nonlinear services which have an impact on opinion forming. Why treat them differently? But there is also a very narrow scope of services which are highly important for public and individual opinion forming um, and which for themselves or by member states have been identified as uh, delivering public value to a considerably higher extent than other kind of services. That today is mostly the case, let's quote it, for public service broadcasters with their linear programs but also with their nonlinear offerings. There might be uh, different models in member states where you also have commercial uh, providers like in the UK where you had uh, define those providers for a different scenario where it came to who has preference in um, obtaining uh, frequencies in order to deliver the service in a, in a terrestrial mode. Um, so that public value notion or um, highly um, influential in terms of individual and public opinion forming might be what I would call a first pillar and then I would see uh, Looking forward, you said 2016 might be the place or the moment in time where you present a proposal. Uh, it might well be that by 2020 the directive is ready to be adopted or even uh, it is already there to be implemented uh, in, in about five or six years time. Uh, much may happen and nonlinear might become even more important than it is today. So that would be one, one option. And then the other, so to say, the other edge of the spectrum, uh, audiovisual services, which are not media services, which would not be covered by the directive today, uh, might also be caught by it, but probably also for some of the uh, policy objectives. Um, when I did the, um, the exercise of seeing what other directives already cover those services, like the uh, Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, for instance. I think that there is not much uh, vacuum to be filled uh, for protection of minors. Things look quite different, but there you have uh, self-regulation uh, at a European scale, which I think would be necessary in any event to have when it is considered to be a, a replacement or a complementary tool to uh, EU legislation. Let me finish by here and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for <laughs> Just a quick question to Lorena. Uh, you mentioned this uh, idea that it may be necessary to introduce self or co regulation at EU level. H how would that work? There are already, in fact, uh, initiatives being taken uh, at this stage, yeah? and uh, and you see, for example, in the in the field of of, uh, of copyright uh, memorandum of understanding for uh, counterfeiting in the fields of, of of the directive or similar to the directive, the colleagues of of Digi Sanko, well Sante, they are called now, 
uh, they are uh, doing things, for example, on alcohol uh, protection. So there are things that are done. There, the, there is also a communication on corporate responsibility that try to set what should be the standards, the minimum standards of self and co-regulation that work. So, in fact, there, there could be a way where you have, of course, self and co-regulation at national level, but there are some minimum things that are set at European level uh, so that, you know, there is some harmonization of the, e even if it's self-regulation. So there are, there are initiatives that are already existing where, where self-regulatory bodies uh, meet uh, regularly in, in Brussels. So it's a way to try to reply to the challenge of, the, of, of fragmentation, if you go that way. So. Thank you. Uh, enough from me. I'd like to open the, uh, the, the discussion to, to all the uh, conference participants. Uh, if you wish to speak, there are traveling microphones. And uh, please state your name and the organization you represent or the country you represent. Who would like to take the floor? Ah, yes, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Dita Seal, and I'm from Cross Sectoral Coordination Center of the Republic of Latvia. Uh, probably my question should have been directed to the speakers of the next panel, but I would like to hear the answers from this, this panel of speakers, so I will be taking my freedom to ask it now. Um, as we all know, uh, the discussions on the audiovisual media market uh, have been raised now not only because of the protection of freedom of speech, but also because of the recent events and clear propaganda happening now in the, uh, Europe. So uh, my question is uh, very simple. Should uh, we protect our societies from the propaganda? Uh, as also our Madame uh, Vita Freiberger mentioned, from the providers of services that are not conducting their work according to the good principles, uh, should it be within the scope of audiovisual media directive? Uh, if yes, how? And if not, then where and how it should be regulated. Thank you. I can take it. Um, of course. Uh, <laughs> In fact, I, I, I also I'm, I'm, I, I forgot to thank for this brooch, which I find really very nice, and that uh, I will probably wear it all along the refit exercise because I see in the little paper that it says that it represents the sons that sees everything and knows everything. So uh, I'll see if uh, the Commission is inspired <laughs> by this Lavian uh, brooch. Um, so I will try to, to answer. Uh, I think uh, we have to be careful uh, in when talking about these matters in what is propaganda and what is hate speech. Because the more you go into the direction of propaganda uh, and try to, to fight it, uh, the more uh, you will need to uh, find the balance with, with free speech. Uh, the more you go into hate speech, the more it becomes uh, clear that there is something to be protected. And, and I think this is the, uh, the difficulty of this exercise, because uh, if you are in the field of free speech, then the best way, from my point of view, to fight a different point of view uh, is by having all points of views possible. And this is why I think for countries like, like, like this one, uh, the directive and the country of origin are extremely important because this is what allows uh, a country to get plenty of different channels and, 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 uh, and on-demand services that will show all the point of views. Of course, if you are moving into hate speech and incitement to, to hatred, to, to violence, then uh, as you know, uh, if these channels come from a place uh, in the e European Union, if there's jurisdiction, the directive deals with these matters. Uh, so it is something that was foreseen, 
and that, by the way, is being uh, applied or tried to be applied in a way. And uh, in all these instances where there have been issues with propaganda coming from third countries, if, the, if there was a, a jurisdiction, uh, then the regulators have met together, I was present in some of these meetings, uh, to try to, to, to fix this matter. Uh, as you know, uh, member states can uh, apply some uh, provisions of the directive that allow them in exceptional circumstances uh, to uh, even uh, suspend channels if there is incitement to hate it. So I think that the directive provides for mechanism for, for these type of situations. Uh, and now the debate is more whether these mechanisms are, and I think I leave this for the, for the panel that will discuss this, how these mechanisms are working, what are the challenges. Uh, we are having this debate uh, with regulators uh, in the contact committee as well. We have uh, debated these matters to see whether there is uh, scope for improvement on, on how to deal with these situations. Uh, my, uh, we both referred to the, uh, the Council of Europe's uh, recommendation on a new notion of media, which I think is uh, uh, an excellent piece of, piece of work. Uh, do you think it would be possible to incorporate the, the criteria for identifying media into a possibly revised uh, directive, and how would we do it? Yeah, that, that it is an interesting piece of reading. I, I fully agree, and I think uh, it should be read more because I, what, what I realize that it's maybe not that not everyone are familiar with this recommendation, and it's a, it's a recommendation from 2011, number seven. And what what I find really interesting is that it it's not in conflict with the directive. So uh, this is uh, something that uh, proves that it could be a useful input, at least during the stage of application. Of course, it's very long. This, uh, this recommendation is more than 25 pages, so it would, be, it would take all, all the directive. But it's, it's indeed uh, providing many, many useful tools when it comes to uh, the indicators as to how to identify what is a media especially when it comes to the expectations from the public. We are discussing about what is TV like, and what I like very much with this uh, recommendation is that it switches a little bit the point of view, considering what is coming from the consumers. I mean, what do they expect to be TV like, which is really a point of contact between the directive and, and the recommendation. And I think it's also mm, appreciable that there is a reference to the ontology, to the professionalism of the activity, which is a work, of course. I mean, we have a lot of audiovisual content available, but not all of it is professional. Uh, we have uh, very much valuable user-generated content, but we have also different types of content that makes it sometimes difficult for users to uh, a certain amount to evaluate if it is reliable and reliability of the sources of information when it comes to free speech again this is a circle where all the pieces are somehow feeding each other so i think this is also a point of contact and uh, it, it's also in line with the ideas of self-regulation at eu level which might be uh, also helpful input so let's see what what the professionals do, how does the environment manage to uh, uh, self-regulate the edges and, and then maybe leave to the regulation the main point. So I liked Alexander's approach speaking about the pillars. Let's select a bit what is the main, what is the core and, and what can be enriched. And I think that this recommendation really provides uh, a lot of valuable input as to this enrichment phase. Thank you, Maya. Uh, there's a speaker here. Yes, uh, hello. I'm, I'm Johan Linden. I'm Secretary General of CIRCOM Regional. We're representing around 300 uh, public media stations in Europe. Uh, and um, your European identity is uh, more than a business model and technology. Uh, it's also about democracy, plurality, uh, perspective. And there's two trends that we have acknowledged and, and see a bit worrying. One is that uh, many independent production companies are being bought by bigger, often American players, uh, in order to peddle the same formats all over Europe, so it's less plurality 
And uh, uh, one of my questions is, is with, would this kind, could this be approached with the scope of the, the directives? And the other, for us, more concerning um, trend is that all over Europe and regional stations, which is very important for regional democracy, minority languages, uh, are uh, being almost extinct, you can say. In Sweden, uh, the commercial uh, uh, TV4 just put down all, all stations, all regional stations. We've seen it in Hungary. We've seen what happens in Spain, in some places, and in Greece. And this is a very wor worrying trend because we get information from all over Europe that the regional TV stations are being threatened from different angles of different reasons. So well, could this be addressed within the scope? That's my question, mainly to Lorena. the others can give their opinion as well. <laughs> well on, on European identity as, as you are aware there is, uh, uh, there is something in the directive uh, which uh, is, is to encourage uh, European works that's of course uh, in a way trying to promote European identity and uh, this is something it's true I didn't mention it because I, I, I'm, I'm normally putting it in the, in, the, in the box of the country of origin but uh, there will certainly be a, a debate in the context of the review uh, about the functioning of this promotion of European wars uh, provisions, in particular as regards on demand. Uh, for the rest, uh, here we, we come in a, uh, into a field uh, where there's a lot of subsidiarity, as, as you are aware, and in particular if, if we talk about uh, public sector broadcasting where, as you know, we have the protocol of Amsterdam that uh, the Commission doesn't deal with these things. It's up to member states to decide what is of, of, of public interest. So uh, these are a little bit the boundaries of how far should we go at EU level in things that are very, very much national. But uh, something uh, that we will discuss this afternoon that is very much related uh, to, that, to this is the debate on, on, on findability and access to public uh, interest information, uh, which indeed is a debate that uh, I must say originally we, we didn't foresee it and it was uh, with the replies to the Green Paper and then the report from the Parliament um, that, that we realized that there is really an important debate about whether uh, it's still uh, easy for people to have access to, to certain type of content. Uh, so if not in the directive, at least it will be in the debate and, and then we will see whether there's any need to act, whether in the AVMSD or in other uh, legal instruments. So. Thank you. On, on both of the issues, perhaps uh, some additions. I, I also think that we already have quite a number of, of uh, instruments within the directive which uh, try to promote European identity and to strengthen it and, and this relates of course to the quota regime for, for linear services where you have the 50% uh, um, uh, obligation requirement um, and uh, you also have a 10% threshold for independent production. I think both instruments uh, were meant uh, in, in order to be uh, a, a motor for innovation and for Europeanization of content uh, to some extent at least and um, the idea being that whatever uh, comes up new will first be shown on television that is perhaps the reason why the, uh, the extension of that 10% quota into the nonlinear did not take place because we still have had the business models in 2005 to 2007 when the uh, latest revision took place at that first window was in television uh, for that kind of formats. Um, nowadays, the, the whole scene has changed fundamentally and it would be interesting to see whether there is also an answer to uh, what kind of um, auxiliary push can be given by uh, a new directive to um, um, the way uh, that new formats, new contents find their ways into the different distribution channels. Um, <coughs> Also, I would like to say that um, for, for me, what I sketched out as a first pillar, the very fundamental, important um, services, um, I think they, they would continue to contribute to European identity very much because they should 
be entitled to the right of short reporting, for example, um, the exclusion of uh, major events from being shown only on pay TV could be modeled in some way also to say that this is something which you might uh, see on those channels preferably um, when it comes to free TV or free services exploitation. Uh, so there's a mixture of incentives and obligations, uh, entitlements and requirements towards that kind of services, which will not necessarily uh, have to be fulfilled by all the other television uh, or on-demand services, but then they are perhaps also lacking some kind of incentive and entitlement which is specific to that, to that kind of services. So I don't think that uh, one should be uh, uh, panicking about the uh, tradition of the European audiovisual market. This is, to me, not, uh, uh, not sure that this tradition will vanish. Um, I think we, we are clever enough to come up with ideas how to preserve it in, also in the future. And this, of course, is despite what André Lange found, that uh, the content of Netflix, only about 20% is European, the rest is American or other international uh, studios production. You call it only? <laughs> okay. Uh, another question there, and one at the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mr. Klaus Jord from the Danish Film Institute, and here I'm also... Uh, a part of the European uh, EFATS, the European Film Directors Networks, which is covering around 30 film institutes around Europe. Um, and we have many questions regarding this AVMS process, but one question I would like to raise here is the question on audiovisual media service aggregators, because a part of the equation, if we want to keep Europe um, at the level playing field and European content distributed to all European citizens is uh, the question of aggregators. If you look at smart TVs and you look at Apple TV boxes, uh, you cannot find European services there. Um, and we have, at least in our vision in the AVMS directive, we have um, a concept saying that if you are a service, being linear or non-linear, you should have some kind of carrying European content, but if I cannot find content in the future having a smart television or having a set-top box in my home because the service is not there, my Danish broadcast is, is not on Apple TV, we, should, we might have um, the obligation also to look into this field when we talk about the digital marketplace in the future. And I think this should also be a part of the refit process to look at the marketplace in order to say what is actually happening on the digital market in order to say, are we there if we complied, uh, if we compared to the vision we had when we made the directive? Because the market, market is changing very fast now. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Gettings from the United Kingdom, uh, working for Ofcom. Uh, I just wanted to thank the panel for such a uh, thought-provoking and, and insightful set of uh, points that uh, they've set out before us. Uh, I don't have a question so much as an elaboration on a, uh, a point that Lorena has already made around the uh, European Regulators Group for Audiovisual Content. So I'm speaking in my capacity as, as the chair of the uh, the working group uh, operating under the auspices of ERGA on material jurisdiction. So I just wanted to bring the, the room uh, up to speed on the work that, that I, with 19 member states, are, are working on to provide advice to, to the European Commission as they start to think about their refit exercise. And what's quite interesting is some of the work and themes that we are focusing on um, accord very much with some of the points that the panelists have made. So the, the scope of that work, which will deliver by the end of this calendar year, focuses on six primary questions, the first of which examines uh, the evolution of the market since the AVMS directive came into effect, and what impl implications the evolution of that market and the players within it might have for the directive. Uh, so that plays very much into Meyer's, uh, I think you called it the value web, Meyer, um, very relevant to the, to the work that we're doing there. The second package of work then focuses on the current distinction between linear 
and nonlinear content and the graduated regime of regulation that currently exists. I'm really bringing to bear on that question the, the experience that we uh, NRAs have as practitioners and interpreters of the directive as, as we go about enforcing the, the requirements of the directive. Then we have our third package of work which focuses on the, boundary of the object, boundaries of the objective and its scope. Uh, in light of many of the trends that we've already been hearing about this morning, is, is the scope uh, quite right and correct? Before then turning in a fourth piece of work to look at the interaction between the AVMS directive uh, and other directives such as e-commerce, telecoms framework, and so on. And we've heard quite a lot already today about the, uh, the role of editorial responsibility, which really does play into that uh, topic of, of the directives and their interaction. We're then planning to round all of that up into a, a, a series of, of thoughts about the consequences that the answers to those four questions might have uh, for players, and most importantly, for the roles and responsibilities of players in light of the underlying goals and objectives of the directive. And those are very important to the package of work as a whole. What was the directive set up to achieve, and what, if anything, has changed that might uh, compromise the directive and its ability to fulfill those goals. So we are just starting out on this journey, myself and, and my colleague member states here. Uh, we have issued a questionnaire as a means of gathering evidence to help us answer those questions and many of you in the room will have received that questionnaire. Um, I'd strongly encourage you to uh, deliver uh, what answers you're able to give uh, by the deadline that we have set um, because that will form a fundamental part of the evidence base we use to inform our thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, there's the microphone over here, please. Peggy, can you see the microphone somewhere? Put your hand up. Thank you. I'm Peggy Valk, University of Leuven. I have um, a couple of specific questions to each of the speakers, uh, which I would also like to thank for their uh, very informative introductions. Um, Maya, I have a specific question with regard to one of the charts you've shown. Um, so the, you said Luxembourg, United Kingdom are like the winner countries when it comes to hosting services that are actually targeting viewers in other countries. Are those services that broadcast then in other languages than English, or are they also active in the UK and, or in Luxembourg and then uh, in parallel in other countries? So the question is, are they only in Luxembourg or the UK, but not targeting that public in order to address the public in other countries? And if so, Lorena, um, has the Commission ever considered a, setting up a procedure which would look like the one-stop shop procedure that they now are envisaging in the context of data protection where citizens could turn to their local DPA, Data Protection Authority, who then would consult with uh, the DPA of the so-called uh, the lead authority where the, the main establish, uh, establishment of the service provider would be. And I believe that maybe ERGA could play, play now that we have ERGA, could play an important role in setting up or facilitating that consultation but for citizens it would be easy they would just turn to their local media regulator if they have an issue with what they see on tv or uh, on the audiovisual uh, service that they consult via the internet and then for alexander um, you refer to the fact that platform regulation is very sector specific today and perhaps a bit outdated um, you refer to must carry rules if i remember well um, in my view, this has been a major problem in the EU regulatory frameworks as they exist today, distinguishing, distinguishing between conduit and content. I don't want to go as far as saying that conduit and con the distinction between conduit and content is dead, but if you see what's happening with mergers between network operators or distributors and content provider, UK, Belgium, right? Eh? Uh, recent uh, couple of weeks, two weeks ago, the Commission cleared the uh, takeover um, by liberty of the SBS channels. 
Um, if you also see the growing role of distributors, don't we need uh, a specific framework for this intermediate layer of platforms like we have since a couple of years already in Belgium. We have this uh, regulation for the intermediate layer, um, which are considered to, um, to have to take up their role also in the, uh, in, in the flourishing of the audiovisual market under the form of contributing to local production, under the form of ensuring uh, that protection of minor safeguards are installed and respected. And perhaps a provocative question, so the first question is, do you think this would be a good thing to set up a specific framework for this intermediate layer, which would be m more than what we have today in e-commerce, which is basically nothing? Um, and second, shouldn't we just forget about net neutrality rules, allow our distributors, network operators, to levy a premium fee? on all those eh, that now are becoming so popular in distributing content and perhaps not even including our local or our European content. And then our local distributors, they can use that premium to reinvest in local production. What do you think? Good or bad idea? Thank you. Well, Peggy, on dangerous ground here, suggesting abandoning net neutrality principle. <laughs> Um, well, an overwhelming list of questions. I, I just picked out and selected the ones that were for me, but we could have really a, a conference devoted to all Peggy's questions. Uh, luckily, I have the data you asked for right here. I didn't project them, but I might give you some information. You, uh, of course, I, uh, we have Ofcom here also in the room, so if I'm uh, missing something, I'm sure they might uh, integrate. Um, when it comes to the challenge established in the UK, according to the data that we have collected in our last yearbook, um, again, small product placement, you find it on our website available, many interesting data. 65% uh, of the channels that are established in the UK, they are broadcasting to other European countries and this also includes many linguistic versions. That was your question, if I am not wrong. Uh, so we have, uh, there, there are many linguistic versions of, uh, for example, Disney, Cinemagic, Viasat Explorer, so it's not only in the English language. And uh, just to mention not only the UK, the UK was the winner and when it comes to linear channels I have here 1017, so we are talking about quite a considerable number, it's followed by France uh, with uh, 215 channels targeting abroad. Sweden has 160 uh, targeting Nordic and Baltic states. Of course, the Nordics, they have the advantage of understanding each other language, so this is not necessary then to target it specifically. And from the Czech Republic, 109 pan-European brand uh, channels that are targeting more the central and south eastern Europe. And the Netherlands wins the prize for the adult channels targeting also many other countries. So uh, each of them have their specialization but uh, the, it's, uh, it's indeed all allowed under the uh, AVMS directive, I would guess. I would say not only allowed, it is encouraged. Uh, I must say that when I see these figures, I'm extremely proud. There, is, there are two principles that are the basics of why the European Union was created with this freedom of establish and freedom to provide services. And that's the beauty of the European Union, that a company can go and establish and provide services from one place. That was about it. The AVMSD had that objective, to facilitate the life of a company. So I, I in fact, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Of course, something different is a parallel debate that is ongoing on tax evasion and all these matters, which is a different thing that is being treated. But as such, the fact that a company provides services across borders is the beauty of the internal market. So I, I, I don't see, uh, honestly, uh, not only what is the problem, but on the contrary. We use these figures uh, to show how the directive is working. Now, your question was, should we establish a one-stop shop, whatever? Uh, I think that the mechanism exists already in the directive. If, if I'm a citizen of whatever country and I see something, and I think there is a, a problem, let's imagine a protection of minors uh, issue, Already I go to my regulator and the regulator, according to the directive, will contact the, the other regulator with this uh, service established and talk and find out whether 
this is respecting the directive, whether there is maybe a, a stricter rule in, in the country of destination, and then there is a mechanism to see whether in those cases something can be done. A, so these things exist already. So we, we now, of course, in the context of the re review of the AVMSD, we will look at everything and we will look at whether these mechanisms are working properly or not. This arises also in the context of the, of the Russian channels, uh, whether there is scope for improvement. We, we will look at everything. But uh, voila, as such, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, shocked or not, not, not depressed with this figure. So, so do you want to, to? I see your body language like, er, er. So, uh, before I, I think she has the right of reply, huh? which is in the directive as well. well. Um, I don't fully agree. I know that this procedure already exists, but you are dependent on the goodwill of your fellow regulator who, has, who is competent. And that might be a problem, especially when that regulator um, doesn't understand the language in which the service is broadcast. So that was actually my... I agree that the directive was set up in order to facilitate transborder uh, flows of audiovisual programs, but in those times it was like a broadcast established in the Netherlands who also wanted to target the audience in Flanders, um, Luxembourg to France. But what do you do when a uh, Estonian channel establishes itself at the UK? And I don't, is Ofcom able, are, are you speaking 20 languages? So how do you control those services? That was my main question. Okay, well, first of all, I think that for every legal instrument, you always depend on the good will of stakeholders to apply it. So I don't think this is special with the directive, and I don't think that regulators in the audiovisual field would be more bad faith than in any other uh, sector. So uh, I, I, I count on the good will of, of regulators. By the way, now with the creation of ERGA, uh, I can assure you that all these things, as, as they happen, are discussed and all the regulators are involved and exchange views. And so this is, if it was uh, working, now it's even improved. And I also uh, can tell you that these things are happening. So we, we sent a questionnaire uh, to uh, regulators to find out how the directive is being applied with the view of, of, of the implementation report. And uh, this is how we realize that, in fact, this is ongoing uh, quite a lot. We only uh, get to find when there is an issue, of course, which is normal, and, 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 and then we, we intervene. This is uh, why the mechanism exists. Uh, now, uh, should the regulator speak all the languages of all the European Union? I mean, you, if you start to question that, then I would say let's question the whole directive, because this is about it. It was to, to facilitate. My uh, view is that uh, for as long as the cooperation mechanism work, you will have someone speaking that nationality uh, complaining, and you will have the regulator going to the other and saying, well, listen, uh, let's talk on what this means and what is the impact. Uh, so, honestly, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not so shocked that suddenly uh, all these are insurmountable. This is uh, already happening, not only in this sector, in, in many sectors where the principle of mutual recognition exists for many years in the European Union. So uh, I think that all the mechanisms that we are putting right now uh, are only improving the situation. And let's improve it even more if need be. Yeah, very briefly, uh, Peggy, even if you did not ask me that question, um, for, the, for those who are connoisseurs of the history of the directive, the uh, former Article 3, Paragraph 3, did contain exactly that kind of, of instrument that uh, a consumer, a viewer, a user would be able to take up a case um, and, and try to seek uh, redress for what he felt would be a violation of the directive. Unfortunately, in 2007, or even before 2007, nobody stood up to defend that kind of possibility, and that might have been due to the fact that um, the very idea uh, turned out, at least in Italy, um, not to be very fruitful when it came to operationalizing it. But that's a different story. Um, I, I'm not sure whether time is left to answer the questions you directed to me directly. Um, first of all, is there a need for regulating platform operators or intermediaries? 
um, well, tricky. Uh, I would say that first of all, there is a diversity of um, manners how a user or viewer can can find his way to content he's interested in, and that not only holds true for distribution ways, ways of co conveyance of signals like satellite, cable, terrestrial, or the internet, but that certainly also holds true for um, offerings available on the specific individual respective um, uh, way of, of distribution. Um, as I said, on the internet you might find an aggregator like ourselves who is trying to make available a platform, a mediatek so-called, from a public service broadcaster, for example. He's offering access to something which is already available, available on the internet as, as such, directly. But it might be interesting for a user to have access to that kind of offering on the very same platform, not changing platforms or not having to change platforms. Um, uh, so, first of all, I would say there's no immediate need, but being aware of how media policy and media regulation usually works, I would add to that that there's a need of making it techn technologically neutral to cover also those aggregators which are not caught by the scope of the directive yet, subject to the condition that we still see a need and can demonstrate, that would be a very interesting exercise for the impact assessment, that we can demonstrate that there is a, uh, a remaining need to do so. And on net neutrality, Andres, are you switching me off now? <coughs> um, you, you asked whether we shouldn't abandon net neutrality principle. I'm not sure we have a net neutrality principle. Um, and certainly we don't have a net neutrality principle in, in legislation except for Slovenia and the Netherlands and also in case law in the Netherlands, the ZIGO and, and UPC uh, merger, where you have some sort of uh, net neutrality idea. Net neutrality, to my understanding, is a means to preserve openness, innovation, diversity on the internet. It's not a goal in itself, it's an instrument perhaps. I think it's not suited for audiovisual content and for many other services who have characteristics which, which we should bear in mind when thinking about regulating or not regulating. So my plea, of course, would be to maintain uh, freedoms for operators, and I mean content providers, platform providers, network providers, and also to be able to, um, to uh, refinance um, the network um, development over the next 10 to 15 years, not least in fixed networks, but also in fixed networks. Uh, so there's a need to do that, and um, quality assurance or quality of service is very important, as I understand, for the uh, audiovisual media due to the characteristics of the service, and if you allow or if you continue not to prohibit quality of service on the internet uh, for these services, uh, you might achieve a balance between existing closed networks for audiovisual content distribution, like satellite, cable networks, or terrestrial, which are dedicated networks to date, uh, and the internet where such uh, services should be available as well. And if we talk about European uh, um, identity and strengthening it, if you look at the players who have managed to uh, achieve some sort of quality of service already on the open best effort internet. These are probably not the players which, to which we attach either in EU legislation or in national legislation obligations which have to do with diversity, pluralism, uh, recent and independent content and so on. So it might always be um, the question uh, to ask to whose benefit is it if we be, be very strict on uh, quality of service or not on the internet. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander, which brings us very nicely uh, to the end of this, the first part of the plenary session. I don't have time to make a, a, a summing up, but I'm very grateful uh, that Lorena has been furiously writing down uh, notes, which she will take back to Brussels. But as I said before, none of our speakers uh, uh, leaves empty-handed. One moment.
So it's lunch now, and lunch is served at the other, hand, other, other end of, of, of the hall, where it says restaurants, which in Latvian means restaurant. And we come back promptly at... We start promptly at 2.30. Thank you.